Hey, welcome back to the Breaking Bad Insider Podcast. My name is Kelly Dixon, and we're here to talk about episode number 311, which is called, what's it called? It's called Abiquiu. Thanks for doing your homework on that one. <laughs> God. Tough room. This is a rough crowd, man. So uh, I'm here with my executive producer, Vince Gilligan. Hola. The director of that episode, Michelle McLaren. Hello. The editor of that episode, Skip McDonald. Hi there. And unfortunately, the writer of that episode is here too, Tom Schnauz. No, I love Tom Schnauz. He's my buddy. One of one of two one writers. Of two writers right. Right. That's right. And oh John yeah, that's Scheiben. right. John Scheiben wrote the other half. Uh, well, thanks you guys for showing up today. Um, uh, I think you guys are going to have to take point on this one because I have not seen this one. So luckily, I have four people here who know the show very, very, very well. I explain why you haven't seen it. Uh, I did not edit this episode. Uh, it was edited by Skip McDonald, and we were so uh, busy this year with only two editors that most of the time we didn't see each other's show, and the show hasn't aired yet. So. And just so you know, Skip, when we did the 307 podcast uh, just uh, not too long ago, everybody was in agreement how much more we like you than Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for being here. You're welcome. <laughs> I just want to give out a shout a shout out to Kelly Dixon. We love I Dixon. love Kelly. I love Skip McDonald. Woo! Kelly love. Kelly cut uh, two hundred nine last year, which was my first experience on Breaking Bad, and she rocks. Of course, we she love does. Kelly. It's just her reactions when we give her shit are so much fun. Yeah. We love you, Kelly. I have a question for you guys. How did you come up with the teaser for this? Uh, the teaser for the teaser is uh, Jane. When we brought Jane and back. And yeah. When we started yeah. doing when we started doing flashback teasers. I just, I mean, I thought Jane was a no-brainer to see again because everybody loved the relationship and wanted to see, and I, I wanted to personally see them together again. So that's, I mean, that was basically it, and it just seemed to fit into this episode. Just, you know, it, it was, we loved uh, Kristen Ritter. Uh, we love, uh, present tense, Kristen Ritter, who played Jane last season, and Jane's character came to such an unfortunate end, and it obviously tore Jesse up so much that uh, we didn't set out this season to have so many uh, what you might call flashback teasers, but uh, it's sort of the way it, it, it's played itself out, and we've had, um, I can't count off the top of my head, but uh, we've done three or four of them at least this season. I mean, almost, almost every odd-numbered episode is a flashback. I mean, 309 is a you know commercial, but it's, I mean, a it's, it's it's different than the rest of the you know, yeah. your normal teasers. Yeah, and we kind of uh, we kind of we didn't set out at the beginning of the season to do that. It was not pre uh, uh, what do you call it predetermined. Uh, it was just we kind of rolled with it after we came up with the first one, which was back in George Masters' episode three with uh, the flashback to uh, Tortuga getting his mm-hmm. head lopped off by the cousins. But um, yeah, it just. Uh, it, it we fell into a uh, inadvertent pattern or rhythm of them this uh, this season and uh, you know what uh, who better to uh, to uh, vi- revisit than uh, Jane who meant so much to Jesse and was a pleasure to work with and, we had, and you know the, in three ten they had come up with the great beat of is it still in the episode where where mm-hmm. Jesse finds the cigarette in the ashtray yeah, right? absolutely yeah. so we wanted to actually see that moment of this is uh, Jesse hasn't cleaned out his car and quite a while and that that cigarette is still there in the ashtray and we see the moment when jane sort of snuffs it out and that is one of those moments that you really you know folks who watch the show closely uh are rewarded uh that's one of those little rewards of watching the show very closely because you know if you watch them out of order i I don't know honestly i don't know why anyone would ever watch a show like this out of order i don't know how you could but it that little moment at the end of this current teaser where she snuffs out the cigarette, and we go close on her red lipstick on the cigarette. It would be meaningless if not for the context of what had happened in the previous episode. Mm-hmm. There'd be it, probably folks who would watch this uh, just happen to catch it might wonder themselves, "Well, what the heck's the point of that shot?" But uh, you know, that's that's the the rewards of uh, watching a, a very serialized, a hyper serialized show very closely. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Well, because you do it out of order, which is, which is, it makes more fun, I think, for the audience, and that's a heartbreaking moment in, uh, in three ten. Yeah, it's such a, a sad scene. moment. Three ten, yeah. wonderfully acted by Aaron Paul and directed by Ryan Johnson, and uh, this is just a great explanation of that, or, mm-hmm. or, or uh, illumination, not so much mm-hmm. explanation, but an, el- illumination. an illumination of that scene. Yeah, it is, and it was, it was interesting when we were shooting it because. Both you and Tom gave me the note uh, ahead of time, very good note, that when we do it, we have to remember for her to throw it away because she doesn't know she's going to die. So this, we had to do it so that it's a poignant moment because Jesse's in love with her, 
but it's a moment that we don't want to, that they're not aware that this is, you know, that this is one of the last few mm. wonderful sweet moments they're going to have together. Yeah. And they, cool. and uh, Kristen, of course, did a fantastic job doing that. Uh, one thing I, I was going to ask you to um, explain, though, that was the title. It's, you know, when I saw it, it was, I mean, it's, I guess you pronounce it. Well, Abiquiu. It's a yeah. town where George O'Keefe lived and yeah. considered her home for many years. And so much, I mean, that's why I picked it, because so much of this episode is about home. Hank not wanting to go home, Walt trying to get back into his home, Jesse finding a new home with this girl, Andrea. I mean, when you talk about home, it's not just a building, it's about people, too, and you know, Jesse's at home in the teaser with Jane. I mean, it's about, I mean, that's his comfort where he wants to be, and that's why I picked the title. And it's, a, it's such a sweet moment, again, for people who follow the show. It's interesting, actually, using the whole George O'Keefe thing um, and, and the painting. Um, what was it called? The, uh, the door? Um, uh, what was it um, called? The, um, my Last Door. My Last Door. My yeah. Last Door. This was a process you guys thankfully had um, boarded this far enough in advance and gave us a heads up in Albuquerque that you'd like to do this. It is not easy to get rights to a painting, especially a George O'Keefe painting. Yeah. And uh, Melissa Bernstein and, and uh, Stu Lyons and uh, Mark Freeborn, our incredible production designer, uh, were all very instrumental in working really hard on getting these rights. And Janine Palminari, who is the most incredible clearance person on the planet, uh, and Michael Troughton. Uh, Michael Troughton's from Sony. Palmieri. 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 Jean, Janine, sorry, Janine. Palmieri, <laughs> I butcher your name. Um, who did an incredible job in, in making this all happen. And then what they have finally allowed us to do was for the art department to paint a replica of, of the real painting. They had to approve it. The George O'Keefe Foundation had to approve the painting and then once we were finished shooting we had to send our replica to them. So they So they our, our department created that. It wasn't we some jacle or something, no. some photocopy or anything. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, we have incredible artists fortunately in the art department. The funny thing is though is we also built the museum portion of that on our stage. Uh, and we did it very inexpensively, it's just a three wall set. And then the other pieces of art that are blurred out in the background, which were also created by our art department, we couldn't actually identify those pieces of art, and that's why everything was shot with a, a long lens. It was part of the inspiration, too. A, a year earlier, we had vi just visited AviQ and George O'Keefe's home and the museum, oh, yeah? so we wanted to, you know, it was fun to get all that in. That's a wonderful job. Not enough uh, sad face clowns on black velvet for my taste, but <laughs> other than that, well, well, well recreated museum. Uh, dogs playing pool and uh, dog play poker. Right, right. poker. And I, I, also, I also like the title ABQ because it um, sort of refers a little bit, sounds a little bit like ABQ from yeah. last yeah. season. Not that right. I, there's anything in the two episodes that connect consciously, but not that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> Where is yeah. ABQ from? It's north of uh, Santa Fe. Yes. So yeah. We right. Shoot. So there's Ghost Ranch, and then uh, Abiquiu is where our home was. Gotcha. Because we shoot uh, in Albuquerque, and then Santa Fe is about 50 mm. miles north of Albuquerque, and then Abiquiu, maybe two, three hours from where we shoot. So we obviously couldn't go to the real place, or not even Santa Fe for that matter. But uh, yeah, our guys, uh, Mark it, Freeborn yeah. and, and W, and our wonderful crew, uh, recreated it very, very nicely. It, it works. works. It, yeah. it, it does. So think about the cool trick you did in the teaser uh, in that one shot. I, I'm always blown away uh, when you do this stuff and when Kelly does this stuff on the Avid. So many things you can do in the Avid that are like magic to me. But this is the one shot where the, the timing wasn't quite right, so you split the screen split in the half. Screen. Yeah, we take two, two separate takes or different pieces of the take and split the screen so we can move people around. Because when Jane exited the frame, she was gone before Jesse exited, so I split the frame and had her pulled her up and had her exiting frame while Jesse was exiting frame. And this also. is that wide reverse. Yes. We're, we're looking over the two of them at the painting. At the painting. Right. And then, yeah, so it was two different takes, and in the left side of the frame, she's exiting, and the right side of the frame, Jesse's yes, saying, yes. Any more doors here we can check out, like yes. real ones? Yeah. And in the, the original take, she was already out of frame. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, we cheated it and made her exit. So once cool. again, thank you for saving my butt. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, you know, I was going to ask, um, because I, I know that this season we have a lot of writers in the writer's room this year, and usually in other seasons, you know, you would usually assign your writers one per script, and then you'd go around that rotation again. And this year, you couldn't really do that, cause you had, so you started doubling up. 
Um, so I was going to ask, even though John isn't here, Tom, what is it like? I mean, you and John have worked together on the X-Files before. I don't know if you've written together before. But um, what is that like, and how do you usually split that up, and what's it like to write? This, I, I don't even know why we just sort of split the script right down the middle, and I took the first half, he took the, the second half. There was no rhyme or reason to it, but, uh, and then we, we traded acts, and we gave each other notes, and uh, I mean, John's great. I love working. Who's better? Oh, me, obviously. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> if you got in a fist fight, who would win? Me. No, <laughs> See these guns? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, is it was it difficult? So it, it wasn't no, it was very any... smooth. I mean, having worked with John on Lone Gunman and X Files, and um, I worked with him on the short-lived series Frankenstein, which only aired one episode. Um, that was a good episode, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, John's John's great. I'm very love working with John. John's cool. a good guy. So when you guys broke the, I mean, you guys, when you're in the writer's room, everybody's breaking. Yeah, we're, everybody's contributing to every episode. Um, yeah, when, when we, I mean, fans of the show know the carding process, and everybody's involved in that. So Is it, was it, like, because I know on episode 10, Moira and Sam wrote that one together, but they didn't split it down the middle, I think. I think she wrote one and three. And yeah. Wrote, yeah, they did yeah, every other I one. Never, I never quite, uh, I left it to... Uh, you know, I wanted to give everybody, I want, you know, I want a believer in that you got to have enough gum for everybody in class, or as it were. <laughs> I want everybody to get an equal shot at writing an episode, you know, one and a half each, if we couldn't, if we didn't have enough for two each, like we did last season. And, uh, but I left it to uh, the writers to split themselves up anyway. I mean, uh, Split up the uh, the writing of each episode any way they wanted. I was surprised how schizophrenic it got. You know, splitting up. I'll do the teaser and you do Act One and then I'll do Act Two. And yeah, I was but, just wondering because I didn't get a chance. I haven't. John and I are smarter answer. than the rest of the writers. <laughs> <laughs> we did the simple, split it down the middle. I'll take the commas and you take the periods. <laughs> but you know, it, it worked out with all of them. Everyone, all all the little teamlets of writers had their own way of doing it and uh, it was good I stayed away from it because they all in, innately sort of did it the way that worked best for them and it worked out really well. So. Well Vince, like on the X-Files I know you're credited along with uh, John and Frank Spotnitz and Chris Carter many times on many episodes. Did you guys ever do it like that or how did that work? We did it every which way you could do it. And we, we did this one thing uh, and, and also it came down to how little time we had, uh, how, you know, how tight a particular deadline was, but we did this one thing where uh, we would set up uh, a laptop and one of us would type and then the laptop was, was wired to a big monitor and the other two of us would sit in front of the big monitor. <laughs> so one person would actually be at the keyboard, and the other two would be sitting, uh, passing judgment over. <laughs> well, not even passing judgment. It's like the editing be, room. You know, we would literally say, uh, "Mulder walks in the room." Uh, no, no, wait. Mulder walks boldly in the room. No, no. What Mulder boldly walking into the room, comma Mulder, and someone Jesus. would type this. Honest to God, it was that nutty. And uh, okay, I think you want to. You'd go with a semicolon here, wouldn't you? No, 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 <laughs> two dashes. Honestly, God, that's literally, I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. Oh, I can't even believe it. And it, it kind of worked. It, it, you wouldn't want to do that for more than one episode at a time, but it, it worked a couple times. Wow. And, and then other times we'd do it the way uh, uh, Tom and John broke up this episode, and we'd go off to our different offices and write uh, different parts and then put them all together when they were done. You know, we tried a little bit of everything to keep it fresh. And it all, every... It'll work no matter how you do it. It'll yeah. work. I mean, the, car the carding is so detailed. I feel like any way you break this thing up, it's gonna, everything's gonna mesh together. <laughs> you know. So. And then you, and then uh, when you're breaking it up, you you are in contact with each other. Oh, yeah. and you say this guy, uh, uh, this guy blankety blank. Or, or, or actually, uh, in, in the case of this episode, uh, what are we calling the young girl at the at the. Uh, uh, at the at the meetings, what's her name? Yeah. And then and I then named her after my sister Andrea. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and Brock is my uh, my godson. Yeah. Seriously, like Barack Obama? <laughs> no, <laughs> Brock. B R O C K. B R O C K. Gotcha. So one last question about that: Do you guys do either of you guys do you like writing as a team, or do you not like writing as a team? Is it harder or easier? Uh, the downside is it's hard to take sole credit. <laughs> and the money, right? You have to split the money? Yeah, you have to split the money. I know. It's all good. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll start. I, 
it, it's 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 great because uh, you get twice as much done in half the time, and uh, the whole thing is a. Uh, I was joking a second ago. The whole thing is a collaborative medium, and anyone who thinks it's otherwise is deluding themselves, <laughs> because <laughs> you, you, this is the most collaborative, and it's wonderful this way. It's you know. It's the same with building bridges or the Empire State Building or whatever. No one person does it, and it's 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 just like the Brooklyn Bridge or the Empire State Building. It's the same with a TV show, and this whole auteur theory of, uh, you know, it's really one person's thing is 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 truly not true. And it's fun to work with people and collaborate with them, especially if you like them and you like being with them, which we're we are all I think uh, speaking for all of us, we're all kind of blessed that we all like each other and work with each other well from our actors to our crew, to our writers, to our producers, to our directors, to uh, to everybody. Our editors. Except, except for Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you make it so easy. I can't help myself. <laughs> but it's we're lucky to have this uh, nice collaboration going. So it's good. Uh, because I haven't seen this episode, um, I, I, that, I have seen a couple of shots. and So I guess why don't you guys talk about that big, huge crane thing that you did? At the end? Yeah, sure. Uh, Sure. Um, This is when uh, Jesse goes to Combo's Corner. um, To we we nicknamed it Combo's Corner because it's where uh, Combo got shot in episode two eleven. Yeah, last year. Yeah. Uh, And so Jesse goes there to see if he can find out if Thomas uh, was uh, actually the kid who killed. Um, him uh, killed Combo and who put him up to it and that kind of thing and of course he meets the uh, the bullet heads that's what we call them right the bullet yeah, heads the yeah bullet heads. anyway so uh, because it's the end of the episode um, I thought it would be nice to do a nice dramatic uh, crane shot and um, the the whole shot's actually not in the episode it, it starts out where we pan the we're up high and we pan the the whole tr- uh, train yard which is beside where. Combo's Corner, and then we see Jesse drive up, and originally I was actually going to, I think I told you guys this the other day, I was going to actually tilt the camera down and then uh, have Aaron get out and uh, spin the camera around so he walks directly under us, and we come around and then kind of pick up to a similar shot that we have now, but as happens every day in uh, shooting, whether it's a film or television, things happen, and the sun was not where we needed it to be, and we had reflection problems and shadow problems and stuff. So we changed the shot and came up with the shot that that we have in there now. Um, and That's I, a cool shot, though. Yeah, no, I was really I was really happy with it. It's 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 uh, it's it's pretty dramatic, and um, I love the the wide lenses. But you're looking at this incredibly desperate area. I mean, it's it's very brown and and. Um, depressing in so many respects and mm-hmm. can you talk about a little bit because you're um you're a great director on our show but you're also a producer on our show and you have to deal with logistics and money and you know this is something that I don't deal with really at all in, in post-production you know but it's as you know we we're talking on different podcasts it, there's a lot that goes into the the smallest things can throw you can throw your whole day off um, just the smallest things. Um, so you, can you talk about, and this is a big thing obviously, but can you talk about what's involved when you have like a big crane like this and the people that you have to deal with and you know all of these things that, because if you're going to get a wide expanse like that, you have to clear That's right. so much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, well, as, as you said, a lot of people involved. Uh, we have a, a great, great And the thing town. is expensive, right? And it is. only it, have for a day or It is like expensive. That. I didn't get the Titan. Some directors do get the Titan, but being a producer, I'm very responsible, and so I don't use this the Titan. This is a crane. This is a kind of this crane. Is a, sorry, it's a type of crane. Well, is the Titan the one you ride on? No, Titan's the one that, that can uh, do a lot more things. Oh, well, yeah, this is 311. Okay, so you know the shot in 310 when we're looking straight down into the vat, and uh, one of the guys is hosing out, cleaning yeah. out the vat, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the camera pulls up and back? Yeah. The, the type of crane that we're using... In the 311 shot could not do that. Only a Titan can do that. It's got more flexibility on the uh, head. It's got an arm that extends out. Mm-hmm. There's just more, there was more options. It's like having a jib arm in the end of a, uh, the end of a crane. And um, oh right, right. So we, we, it's just not as much flexibility. But um, anyway, we have a great grip named Tom. I think is our uh, Thomas. He brings in. He owns the crane or he operates the crane and he brings it in. So you have additional people that are involved. And then you have to lock off everywhere you see. So on every side street, there's a cop or a PA or somebody preventing from a car or a person 
driving in or walking into your shot. And in actual fact, I, I don't know if it's in the one we use, but we have what we call a bogey, which is somebody who's not supposed to be in the shot, enters it deep in the background, uh, in the top right hand side of frame, but you can't tell who it is. And we, uh, uh, it, it looks fine. It looks like somebody could just yeah, be walking through this. People do just, live in that neighborhood. Yeah, you, it's exactly. not weird to see someone walk in the sidewalk. No, it's, yeah. But, but, but it's, that's a oh, tough, sorry. I just, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna say it's a thankless job being a, God bless all the, uh, Traffic PAs and I, I know right. uh, and Tom course, and I did that. In, yeah. yeah, Tom and I did that in New York. I did it for like one day in New mm -hmm. York, trying to stop people from parking or driving mm -hmm. through the shot. And yeah, you get. Yeah, called. I was a parking PA for seven years. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was a. Son. And this is his first it year. A, uh, seven years in uh, one night <laughs> in New York. That's how it is in New York. It, it was this summer, I think, of yeah. being a parking PA. I started as a people, parking PA. Yeah, yeah people oh, do yeah. not like being told they can't yeah. drive through or no. park can't park here. Oh, businesses love that. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah no, they People love, love you. But it's your it's your AD staff that organizes all of this uh, in in prep and on the day. Yeah. They, they're executing it, and the, and they work with the PAs, the location PAs, and and the uh, the AD staff, and they do a phenomenal job. And but of like, course, we're working really really fast. But also, like in you have to know in prep that you want to do a shot like this. this yes, it's a big. We call it a money shot, right? Yes, this is a money shot. And you gotta you gotta know in prep because you've got to schedule that day. You've got to schedule all the way around. Get a permit. It. There's all not only things. do you have to know in prep, yeah. you have to know really early on in prep. Yeah. So I always so you feel read your script early as soon too. as you read yeah, your yeah. script, yeah. if you when you go into the concept meeting, what, what happens is when we get our scripts, as soon as everybody's had a chance to read it, and sometimes it's about an hour and a half after you've received it, just yeah. because of the pace we go at, all the heads of departments get into a room with the writers, with Vince, the director. And we conceptualize about the entire script. We'll go through it and discuss everything. If you have an inkling in that meeting of any toys or anything that you want to use, it's a good time to start telling people. It, you know, you're always going to uh, there be in a situation where somebody's going to say, well, we can't have that, we can't afford it, it doesn't work out schedule-wise or whatever. But it's better to start thinking about that stuff as quickly as possible. And, and this is something that has to also happen. You're saying all your department heads come in, but everybody's shooting at that time too. Well, this is your, your right, but all your department heads are prepping. Yeah. So as a as a but there your but production is still going on. Absolutely. For the episode that's shooting now. Absolutely. So I mean these guys. Yeah. Mike Slovis is has to be on the set, but he's also he's no he's not in a concept meeting. Oh, okay. It's only when he's directing because okay. he's got to be on the set shooting. So you have your on set play. Uh, members of the crew and they're always on set and then you have your prepping crew and then you have your heads of the department that oversee both of them so there's there's a lot of there's uh, a communication Michael, Michael send his, all the time Michael send a, he will to the production meeting send his, uh, his gaffer and key grip right right to to go and they'll go on the tech scout yeah and uh, so he has to spare them for quite a bit yeah. Yeah. yeah which is not easy in and of itself no no I mean it's it's really making anything in television or film is such a a team effort oh, yeah. you know, there's no one person that that uh, can take the credit for making something. So well, maybe you, Vince Gilligan. When, yeah. <laughs> when, when you get something like this and you want to use a shot like that, do you like? You, is it something that you get like one? You get one shot like that, and then the rest of your episode, you know, it's you have a, to pick that's and a very your that's a very good question. Absolutely, you have to pick and choose your b battles, and it depends on the episode that you're doing as well. But yes, you you're not going to have four days of a crane. You're not going to have three days of a crane, and you're lucky if you even get two days of a crane on a budget of this size. So you really want to pick your moments and you want to make sure you get those shots. Yeah, you know, yeah. so. Cool. Yeah, it's allocating very limited resources mm -hmm. and very limited time to the best use. Uh, yeah, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. And you gotta know what time of day you want to get that crane shot. Because yeah. like you're saying, you don't want, you cannot have, you can't go to all the expense and trouble setting up the crane and then realize it's yeah. casting the shadow of the crane onto the thing you're shooting. Right. No, in fact, we actually set it up at this particular time because the guys thought this was going to be the best thing for the shadows. But I can't remember what happened that day. If the it was just lit, that much later in the year and the sun wasn't where it thought where exactly where they thought it was going to be and everything. But you you punt and we changed it and we got a great shot. And yep. sometimes we change things story script wise and you end up with something better. I mean, it's just yeah yeah you know. yeah. Now you know, last year we had um, our characters go to uh, like a a uh, narc. Narcotics Anonymous? Narcotics Anonymous meeting. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, NA, or yeah, Nar Nar So, yeah. this time, you've got these guys going to, I don't know if it's technically Narcotics Anonymous, but you've got them going to sort of a, a meeting. We, 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 don't, we don't identify it by any sp specific, uh, you know, uh, 
particularly. But yeah, they're going to a support group kind of a meeting, and and, and now you've got them pushing. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're supposed to be so pushing. I thought, they're I thought supposed that, that to went over to. big, huh? These are the most lovable meth dealers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, no, it's a nasty thing, uh, extraordinarily nasty thing Jesse's doing here with this uh, wanting to do. He's the, a bad guy. He's a bad guy. Yeah, he's uh, he's trying to be. We're not sure, you know, what's what's he up to exactly. It's tricky. It's tricky. Uh, well, I remember when we talked about this whole storyline of why would Jesse be selling again? I remember it was we had all seen a lot of us had seen the Hurt Locker and that whole idea of it's sort of ingrained in you and you can't help <laughs> but but do it. And in the end of the Hurt Locker, is the guy is determined he's going to go back to Iraq and defuse bombs. And and Jesse has it in him that he just wants to that thrill of. I mean, is in 309, I think, is when it's a scene in the restaurant where he just describes all the, how great it was with the RV and, and selling and being his own man, and that this is what he's trying to recapture. So you're saying it's noble and patriotic, yeah, much like the Hurt Locker. Yeah, I want, to see him, <laughs> I want to see him sell meth to you, unsuspecting. I think it also goes back to the pilot, which was one of my, I'm the pilot, excuse me, episode 301, um, which is one of my favorite moments when Jesse says, I'm the bad guy. I, I think it is, all joking aside, I think that's sort of what it is. And I think it's, uh, he hates working for the man, mm -hmm. quote unquote, which is sort of what he's saying uh, in this episode. He's saying, uh, you know, I'm, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting this one confused with episode nine. I'm sorry. They all <laughs> run together in my head at a certain point. But but back in episode nine, he says, uh, you know, I work at this uh, laundry, this big laundromat, and my boss is a dick. And, it's Kafkaesque. And it's Kafkaesque. <laughs> And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's different levels of working for the man. Even, even in a criminal enterprise, apparently you can uh, nonetheless find yourself working in a soul-deadening job for the man. Mm -hmm. So I think he's uh, lashing back against that. And it's not about the, it can't be about the money. He's got more money right now than he's ever had in his life. How could it be that he needs more money? Because he's talking about selling a pittance. You know, a teenth, a teen or a teenth here and there. It's just, it's about the thrill of doing it. Which, of course, in no way, shape, or form, we're saying this is, we're not patting him on the back for this. It, it's not a good thing he's doing, nor do we right. write well, it. No, I mean, it is. It's just a, it's a, car it's a character. Self destructive. Uh, yeah. It's self destructive. Yeah. He's got nobody he's alone, and then he finds this, yeah. this girl who. No, you guys have pretty much made it clear what can happen if you do take this. Choice. Yeah, yeah, man. I never yeah. thought this many people Direction would be dying. <laughs> well, it's just, we you know, started out, and it's just a, we don't we don't judge our characters. We but don't think that we we think they're doing good things here. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is obviously these are people who make extraordinarily bad choices, starting with Walter White and working uh, working. I mean, yeah, Walter White's infected everybody. Everybody. He's <laughs> sort of the, the ripple effect. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. Uh, he's causing everybody else to make really really bad decision. Doesn't mean we don't love writing for him and, and you know we find him interesting as all get out but uh, I speak it for myself but he is not these are not good decisions uh, you, you keep wanting to shake these people by the lapels and say what the hell are you doing mm -hmm. but uh, they always do have the reasons they may not be good reasons but they have the reasons nonetheless. So, so um, Tom you wrote in the cutest little boy in this show and Michelle, you had told me a story a couple of days ago. I was wondering if you could tell that story again about the little actor's name is Ian. Ian, um, yeah. But uh, and you said he gave you no trouble. Oh at right, all. yes, yeah. Um, Ian Posado. So, is that is Posado? Uh, Posado? Is that Karen Alta? And anyway, Ian is is uh, again we uh, Kira, our wonderful casting person in um, Albuquerque, put the call out to the schools and everything, and all these little kids came in, and Ian was one of them, and he got the part, and he's fantastic. Really well behaved. Never been on a film set before. I uh, listened to everything I said and everything else everybody said until this one moment when we were shooting in the uh, taco cells, and um, I wanted to do a shot with him sitting at the table with Jesse and and uh, Andrea, and of course he's very little, so I needed him to be sitting up high. So it, the crew's setting up the shot. Everybody's around, and I said, "Okay, Ian," and when you're putting the the actors in position and you're blocking the scene the whole crew is listening so everybody's stopping and listening and I looked at Ian and I said okay Ian now we're gonna put you in a booster and he looked at me and he gave me a look that was so defiant there was absolutely no way I was gonna argue and he looked at me and he said uh 
no. <laughs> and I've been around kids enough to know there is no point in arguing with this. And I said, right, no booster. Let's put apple boxes under the chair. We'll raise them up that way. Um, anyway, he's, he was wonderful to work with. But uh, yeah, yeah, don't, put a six year, do, don't put a don't put a six-year-old in a booster chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. He's a cute little guy. He's a good little actor, too. I mean, he's yeah. Really, yeah. yeah. He knew his lines. and. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's challenging for the editors when you shoot with kids, as you guys, as Kelly, you know well, and skips. Yeah. Sometimes with they, the actors as well. Well, sometimes, but, but, <laughs> but with the little kids, they, they look at their marks sometimes, or they'll look in the camera, yes. and so you have to go through and talk about that. Yeah, or well, they'll say no. Yeah. yeah. No, we, have, yeah. we just have to go through and make sure they're not looking at their marks or looking at the camera, and... Uh, Ian was great. I don't think he ever looked at the camera once that I recall. He did a good job. And uh, he was he interacted with Aaron or Jesse yeah. quite well. Well, Aaron's really good with the kids he too. Yeah. He just brings he makes them feel very comfortable what it looks like. That's and, right. Yeah. And he brought a lot to the to the table with with Aaron and and Brock. He was really good in every scene we did, and we never really had to cut around him because he was doing something he shouldn't be. He was always there. Always knew his lines. He was and matched. Even, and even yeah. he improvised. Yeah, he improvised. He did. And he, he remembered he wrote, his lines. Yeah, yeah, he wrote his own line, and uh, and and it ended up in the cut. And he matched it yeah. every time. He did. He was. Yeah. <laughs> well, Aaron well, improvised a little it? thing. Aaron improvised a little thing with his fingers, switching fingers from hand to hand. And Ian says, "That's not real." <laughs> and that was his own line he wanted to say. And I said, we're like, "Yeah, sure, say that." Yeah. <laughs> and every he did it every take. He did it yeah. the same way. He helped. And he helped Michelle with some of her shot composition. He did. He did. He, you know, he said, "I think you should use a thirty-five he a 40 here." Millimeter and, yeah, exactly. he, helped, he helped change <laughs> the crane shot. Yeah, my <laughs> um, Can you go into a little bit, like uh, Emily Rios? Who plays Andrea is not. She's young, right? She's not even twenty-one. She's, she's very much 19. younger than we imagined. Yeah, <laughs> we, we cast her. We didn't realize how quite how young she was. She's twelve. Yeah. She's, 12. <laughs> she's really good, though. It's like when she's I first great. saw her, I didn't realize that she was doing our show, and I was watching um, Men of a Certain Age, and she plays like a high school student in that. So when I saw her, I'm like, wow, she looks like the same that the same actress, and she did a great job in that. Emily did a fantastic. Uh, job. She's a really, really good actress. And we have a scene where she's in bed with Jesse, and they have an argument. She gets up and she gets out of bed, and presumably she's naked. And um, uh, Michael Slovis uh, promised that the and she's not really naked when we shot it. Of course, and, you know, actors are always uh, covered up, but you want to make it look like they're naked. And so he shot it so she's in silhouette. So when she came into ADR, it was her opportunity to see the picture. We weren't concerned in any way, neither was she, because it was shot very tastefully thanks to Michael Slovis um, and it's a beautiful beautiful scene so it's uh, she did she really did a fantastic job with it and and we actually cut that scene we a little bit we, we actually put a little bit of the dialogue out of order and uh, you yes. did a great job of, of yeah blending we, that. we rearranged the dialogue to, yeah. to make her say something well she's what she said she said but we rearranged it to make a different sentence out of it right right exactly. it's amazing how much uh, you know I we should talk some more about the editing uh, in specific to this episode and in general because it's just it always amazes me as much time as I spend in the editing room with you guys how many tricks you have at your disposal and how much uh, I mean you know for instance uh, very often it's the case we'll like the picture for one episode and we'll like uh, a specific line reading from, from an episode I mean episode we'll like the picture from one take and we'll like the line reading from another take, and you guys will marry the two. You'll yeah. stuff the line reading from one take into the mouth of another take, and you know it's, it's a lot of tricks to this trimming frames yeah. here and there, a and lot of finessing and stuff. And we get lucky sometimes. Some, yeah, some... and sometimes we don't. You're like, <laughs> try again. I'm going to go play Bosconian. <laughs> try again. I know you can do it. it I, I like I like to see both both of you guys flex your muscles. And when we ask for the impossible, and you go, you love the challenge, and then you you flex your hands, and then you approach it like you're about to play something. On and then piano. you put your hand, head down. And you're just like, oh my god, it's not going to fit. It's not going to fit. Well, there's a trick Skip did. I don't. And I can't even remember now if we talked about it in the podcast podcast for episode one but uh there's two shots in episode one of this season one of them was where walt lights uh the barbecue grill full of money yes and the other at the end of the episode where one of the uh, uh cousins drops his cigarette into the weeds the gasoline soaked weeds underneath the truck and catches the weeds on fire and in both those this tremendous eruption of flames covers over the lens and you did the best trick, because you, you cut that episode, yes. Skip. You did the best trick. Tell them about that trick and, and where you got the piece of burn. Well, there was a, 
after the truck exploded, there was a camera in the on the ground that got enveloped with the fire, and it actually melted the camera. So I took a piece of that fire and I did a what we call a circle wipe. So when the the like the cigarette hit the gasoline, I just expanded it to fill the frame, so it was it looked like an ignition. So so and we did yeah. the same thing on the barbecue. Yeah, it was so well done because <laughs> in the barbecue shot and in the shot in the weeds. You know the the burning uh, matches, the burning cigarette lands, and nothing happens. Right. And so you took a whole other piece of footage from a damaged camera that luckily the footage survived. <laughs> survived. So that camera actually, even though we that was a digital camera, that was not a film camera. <laughs> well, even though we wiped out this camera doing it, the the footage survived. Thank goodness, and it uh, it really paid great greater yeah. dividends than it would have paid otherwise. Because yeah. by the way, that's another thing that folks listening are like, what do you mean all these cameras? There's only one camera angle in that sequence. But that's because four or five cameras were shooting that explosion, but we elected to just show one. one angle, yeah. which was fun because it was so damn good in one angle. There's no reason yeah. to intercut. So. It was very effective in yeah. one shot. Yeah. The, the editors, just to speak about seeing your prizes a bit more, you guys too, is they're a huge help to us when, um, if we've shot something, uh, even, you know, with, depending on whatever, it's another director, another episode, and we need to pick up inserts, or we rely on you guys a lot ahead of time to communicate to us something that we might need or you think might be helpful mm -hmm. and uh, in, in, in matching and screen direction uh, just to help it more put more dramatic emphasis on something and you guys are a huge help to us actually in the shooting process uh, if we are as I said doing pickups or inserts or, or something yeah. cut that quick we need that in two hours <laughs> <laughs> quick time it to us yeah. Yeah. I just got it um, sorry, we had to cut yeah. it short this time, but uh, we are actually going. It's not to that the, short. We're going for nah, minutes. Actually, for... but uh, we have to go to the mix of this this episode right now. You guys are going to mix this episode that we're doing the podcast. So, so hopefully, it came out way. well. And it's <laughs> in Chinese or something. And, uh, <laughs> so, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about episode number three twelve, which is called God, called half, half, measures. Measures. half measure. Half measure. Is it measure or measures? Half, half measures, uh, plural. Okay. Yeah. Half measures. Yeah. Didn't you edit that one? Yes, I did. Oh my God. But all the titles came down as TVD this year. I mean, you know, all these titles, I had no idea. Not mine. I didn't do yours. <laughs> so, uh, thanks everybody for listening. Let's go break bad.